God bless you. Good evening. Hallelujah. Welcome. Welcome. This is Transforming Word Ministries Tuesday night Bible study. I'm Apostle Marcos, a men pastor of Transforming Word Ministries. I just want to welcome all of you that are logging in right now and those of you that are watching the recording either at our website or on Facebook or on YouTube. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you, Brother Frankie, Brother Kenyatta. Welcome. Hallelujah. We're about ready to start. Uh, before we get ready for tonight, uh, just to give a quick update, uh, available at uh, my website, which is transformingwordnyc.org, and available at lulu.com are uh, two of the newest books that I have written. One here is the fully annotated uh, book on the book of Daniel. And this is a result of uh, a good four or five months worth of study that I've done in preparation for the series that I've done on the book of Daniel. And of course, everybody knows that the book of Daniel is instrumental in help, helping us to understand the book of Revelation. So these books are available now. Amen. If you don't want the uh, don't want to wait for the print edition, amen. You can order it online at lulu.com as an ebook, or it will be available in other places like Barnes and Nobles and Amazon.com uh, within the next four to five weeks. In addition, I also have my revised books on the Book of Revelation, Book One, which is uh, chapters one through twelve, and Book Two. Amen, which is the balance of the book of Revelation. Just like the book of Daniel, they are fully annotated. This took me about a year to do the study to be able to put these in book form. And these are also available at lulu.com. Amen. If you go to our website, the link is directly there. Um, they're also available in ebook format. Amen. And this is for anybody that would be interested in. Uh, ordering those books. And I just want to thank you in advance for supporting my ministry. Amen. And I pray that you are blessed by it as well. Hallelujah. God bless you, brother, Sister Laura. God bless you. We are right about ready to start. And before we begin, let us pray. Heavenly Father, hallelujah. Father, we thank you for teaching us and guiding us, Father, and revealing to us the secrets of your kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God, Father, that you've placed in your word for us. Father, I ask that you help my flesh decrease so that your spirit may be increased, Lord, that your people would be edified, that you would be glorified. Holy Spirit, I ask that you take over and guide us in tonight's study on the parable of the leaven. And Father, we give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to start for this evening. Amen. Well, God bless you, Sister Lord. Thank you for connecting with us, and I hope that you're blessed by the study. Let's begin. Uh, this is the story. Well, this is the parable of the leaven. And just to backtrack slightly, the hidden truth of God's eternal plan is referred to in Scripture as a mystery. A mystery is an unrevealed truth that was previously hidden, but it's now being made clear for those who will accept the truth. Parables speak this revealed truth in a type of coded language so that only those that are authorized by God to be able to understand it will understand it. Now, the Bible tells us that there are four mysteries or hidden truths of the kingdom of heaven in Scripture, and they're given in the following order. The parable of the sower, the parable of the wheat and the tares, the parable of the mustard seed, and tonight's parable, the parable of the leaven. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to go to verse 33. Hallelujah. 
And before we get started, amen, um, I, I ask that you get your Bibles out, amen. Follow along with me. I have a tendency to go a little fast because I try not to keep people uh, too late. Uh, get a pen, pad, take notes, amen. If you have any questions or anything that the Lord drops in your spirit, write it down at the end of the teaching. We will have a period of time, questions and answers or comments, amen. So follow along, amen. God bless you. Matthew 13, verse 33, another parable spake Jesus unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. As we have been covering, scripture interprets scripture. Now, some people believe that Jesus used common examples so that the people that were present would easily understand it to being able to relate it to something that was second nature to them, perhaps. But if we look in scripture, we will see that there are specific instances and incidents and, and events and people that Jesus was talking about and often referred to in his parables. We'll come across that a lot more as we go further in this study on the book of parables, what well, or Jesus' parables, amen? But we should always allow scripture to interpret scripture. There is one instance in the scriptures of a woman doing just this, hiding leaven in three measures of meal. And that woman was Sarah, the, husband, the wife of Abraham. So let's hold that place there in Matthew. And let's turn to Genesis chapter 18. We're going to read verses 1 through 15. And we're going to see the event that surrounds what Christ is talking about in his parable and how it relates to the kingdom of heaven. Genesis chapter 18, starting with verse 1. Hallelujah. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And Abraham lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him, which scripture just told us was the Lord. So these three men are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when Abraham saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, my Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel and I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your heads. And after that, ye shall pass on, for therefore are you come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. Verse six, and Abram hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. Now let's pause there for a moment. Cakes is the Hebrew word uga, which means bread in a circular shape, like a disc. So in order to make bread, leaven had to be added to the meal. This is alluded to in Abraham's command to her to knead it. And this would allow the leaven to permeate the dough and cause it to rise evenly. Hmm. Verse seven. 
And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. Now, let's look at this. It's easy to assume that this calf was a baby lamb. But this is the, the Aramaic word bakar, which means an animal of the ox family. However, this baby ox is symbolic of Christ. Mm. In Revelation chapter 4, John gives the description of four living beings that stood around the throne of God. So let's hold that place there in Genesis, and let's turn quickly to Revelation chapter 4, verse 7. This is what John recalls seeing in God's throne room, surrounding God's throne. And the first beast, which is more accurately translated as a spiritual being, it was alive. The first beast was like a lion. And this symbolizes royalty. This corresponds to the Gospel of Matthew, which depicts Jesus as the coming king and Messiah. Continuing verse 7, and the second beast like a calf. Ah, this is the Greek word moskos, which means a bullock. And a bullock is a young bull that has had part of its sex organs removed so that it can't breed. And it's, we know it better as an ox. Hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have a brief technical difficulty here. My uh, Bible just went on me, but I'll, I'll bring it back in just a second. Hold on. Hallelujah. Amen. We are back. Amen. So it's better known as an ox. And let's continue. Well, to give you just a little bit more information about the ox. The ox is a beast of burden. It's a servant. Amen. Hallelujah. Y'all pray for me because uh, the devil is trying to mess everything up tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, I'm back in my spot here. An ox is a beast of burden, and this corresponds to the gospel of Mark, which depicts Jesus as a humble servant. So this shows us uh, the, the, how it corresponds to uh, the calf that Abraham asked this young man to prepare for the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as an offering. They ate it. Amen. Let's continue. Hallelujah. My, uh, my tablet keeps uh, going out, even though it's fully charged. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Having a little trouble this evening. I've never had this problem before. Amen. I want to keep everything right where it is. Hallelujah. Let me continue the rest of this verse. And the third beast had the face as a man, which symbolizes the image and likeness of God. Hallelujah. This corresponds to the Gospel of Luke, which depicts Jesus as the perfect and sinless man. Hallelujah. I keep having this very same problem here, and I, I really apologize. Amen. I, I didn't have this problem last time. Hallelujah. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle, which symbolizes soaring majesty. And this corresponds to the Gospel of John, which depicts Jesus as the Logos of God, or uh, God in human form. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm sorry, y'all, please bear with me. I am so sorry. This has never happened before. Amen. Father, I ask that you would take over and, and cause your 
creation to function in the manner that it is meant to function. Hallelujah. So, as God's humble servant, Abraham offered God a baby animal servant, which is the ox. Amen. And I don't think Abraham realized it, but this was symbolic of the future Messiah. This parallels Abraham's later willingness to give his son Isaac as an offering to God, just as God had requested of him, commanded, so to speak. And Isaac is a type of Christ because both Christ and Isaac were promised child or children, amen, and they were both conceived supernaturally. Hallelujah. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 18, picking up with verse 8. Hallelujah. God bless you, Sister Summer. Amen, Brother Peter. God bless you. Welcome. Uh, right now we are in Genesis chapter 18, We're picking up with verse 8. And Abraham took butter and milk and the calf, which the young man that he gave the calf to, had dressed and set it before the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Abraham stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which shows that all three persons of the Godhead operate in unity, they said unto Abraham, Where is Sarah thy wife? And Abraham said, Behold, in the tent. Now, don't miss these symbols. The tent is a prefiguring type of the tabernacle. Before the temple was built, and when Israel wandered in the desert, the tabernacle was a portable temple made out of a tent. Remember the three stages that we were talking about regarding the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Here we're seeing three stages as well. The tabernacle, which is the infant stage. It became the temple, which is the second immature stage. Revelation chapter 21 shows us that the bride of Christ, who is New Jerusalem, not the church, but New Jerusalem, shows us the bride of Christ. And Revelation chapter 21, verse 21, tells us that the Father and the Lamb, who is the Son, are the temple of New Jerusalem. This is the final mature stage. So we're seeing this same pattern repeat. The kingdom of heaven having three stages where it was implanted into the heart of man as a seed, which was the gospel, where it has grown now. And when Christ returns, it will be transformed into the kingdom of God when all sin and unrighteousness and rebellion are purged from it. We also compared this to the stages that are seen in, in nature with butterflies that begin as larvae and transform into caterpillars and then undergo a final metamorphosis into the butterfly. Here we're seeing the very same thing with the temple. It started out as a tent, became a tabernacle, and then uh, it assumed its final form as the temple made out of wood and stone, but its final form will be in New Jerusalem in the kingdom of God. Right now, we are in the second stage, and we are waiting for the third stage. Hmm. I, I hope somebody can see this. Amen. Abraham. This shows us that Abraham is a type of the father, God the father. His wife, Sarah, is a type of New Jerusalem, 
being the wife, the bride, and also being hidden from view. We look at Jerusalem now, but New Jerusalem is in the spiritual world being prepared. And as Revelation chapter 21 also shows us that once Christ returns, New Jerusalem will descend out of the heavens to the earth. Right now, we can't see her. Just like at this particular point, Sarah is in the tent and cannot be seen. Mm. And their soon to be born son, Isaac, as we already discussed, is a type of Christ. Hallelujah. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 18, verse 10. And he said, notice this is singular, not plural. He said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, which is the springtime. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. He said, now remember earlier, we heard they said, where is Sarah, thy wife? But now we see verse 10. He said, so which singular person of the Trinity said this? Ah, remember, Isaac is a type of Christ. That's a hint. This, this event right here parallels the visit to Jesus's mother, Mary, in Luke chapter one. It also parallels the visit to Elizabeth, who was the mother of John the Baptist, who was the forerunner to Christ. So we can perceive that it was the Holy Spirit that said this to Abraham, because it was the Holy Spirit that also descended upon Mary, causing her to conceive the baby Jesus. Well, here the Holy Spirit will do the same thing with Sarah. And Isaac is a type of Christ. You see the connections now. Hallelujah. Let's continue the balance of verse 10. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind Abraham. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women, meaning she was well into menopause. Therefore, or for that reason, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Now, Sarah wasn't laughing in anticipation. She was mocking God in doubt. In other words, and and it's okay for us to laugh at this too, because we can read between the lines and understand what it is that she's saying. She's like, yeah, right. I'm, I'm too old to have children. And Abraham is too old to participate. Right. Yeah. Now I'm going to have a baby now. Right. It was that kind of thing. But she did this within herself. She didn't do it out loud. Verse 13, and the Lord said unto Abraham, wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. He's making this quite clear that this will happen. Verse 15, then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And the Lord said, nay. In other words, you may not have laughed and mocked me outwardly, but thou didst laugh inwardly. 
Ah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So this passage speaks of God's future intervention in human events. God promised a child through supernatural means for I, uh, Abraham and I, uh, Sarah, their son being Isaac. And the blessing of God's covenant with Abraham would be given to Abraham's descendants through Isaac. Now, since Isaac was of supernatural conception, all of Isaac's descendants that were prophesied to be more numerous than the stars in the sky and more numerous than the sand on the shore, they were also of supernatural conception. They existed only because Isaac existed. Ah. So in the same way, God caused the supernatural conception of Jesus through his human mother, Mary, and Christ would make the supernatural birth or rebirth, we should say, of sinful man possible through a process of God's grace called regeneration. Jesus speaks of regeneration in John chapter 3 using the phrase born again. So to be born again means to have been regenerated. In John chapter 3 verse 3, Jesus answered, and he was talking with Nicodemus, and he said, verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you that except a man be born again, he cannot see or perceive with his mind the kingdom of God. Born again is the Greek word genio anothen. It doesn't mean a repeated action. It means to be stimulated from above, from God. This spiritual stimulation is God's gift of grace called regeneration. That enables man to be capable of understanding the gospel and responding to it, should he choose to. Remember, we covered last week that Paul states that the natural man, which is the unsaved person, the condition that we're all born into earth on, the natural man cannot perceive the things of God, nor can he be subject to the law of God because the things of God are spiritually discerned or understood. So if the natural man, the, the unsaved person, the way we're all born into this world, if we cannot understand the things of God when we hear it, like the gospel of Christ, then how can anybody be saved? That would make it impossible because we would outright reject the gospel as being foolishness, a waste of our time. So how could anybody be saved? This is where regeneration comes into play. God initiates it. And what he does, basically, it's a reestablishing of the spiritual connection between God and sinful man, which allows man to be able to perceive the things of God through the Holy Spirit. It's not a restoration of relationship, it's not. And it's not salvation. It's merely a regenerating of the spiritual connection between God and man. That's all it is. This enables man now to be able to perceive the things of God, in this case, the gospel, and respond to it positively should man choose to. A great analogy would be, and the Holy Spirit gave this to me this afternoon, it would be like a person in a pitch black room with no light, and this person, on top of being in a pitch black room, is also blindfolded. 
Somebody can come into the room with light, but because he's also blindfolded, that person cannot even see the light. And if somebody were to say to him, hey, there's light in here, he would dismiss it as foolishness because being blindfolded, he sees nothing. God's gift of regeneration is like simply taking off the blindfold. He's still in pitch blackness, but he can now see the light. And the person holding the light can say to him, listen, there's a kingdom that is full of this light. In fact, there is no darkness. You're in darkness now. If you'd like, I can show you this kingdom full of light. Only if you want to. You can choose to come with me or you can choose to stay. Choice is yours. Because man does have free will choice. Jesus says also in John chapter 3, the same chapter, that this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world, but men loved darkness because their deeds were evil. And some reject the light and choose to remain in darkness because they wanted to continue their evil deeds. That's like the person in the pitch black room with the blindfold being able to hurt other people around him. And the other people are hurt, but they don't know who did it because they're blindfolded also. So he gets away with it. However, going into another place where there is no darkness means that everything he does and did would be exposed. This is the condemnation. Some would rather stay in darkness. Some would rather continue to commit sin because they can get away with it. Because they enjoy it. Because they don't want to be accountable for the things that they've done in their lives. Mm. Regeneration, as I said, does not reestablish relationship. It doesn't provide eternal life. However, it is the doorway that leads to those things. First things first, one must believe the gospel. And regeneration enables the unsaved person, the natural man, to be able to perceive what the gospel is talking about and choose to respond to it either positively or negatively. It's, it's, it's really very simple. This is what it means to be born again. But tradition in the church teaches that being born again means being a Christian and having salvation. But that's not what it is. Hallelujah. We should allow scripture to interpret scripture. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you, Brother Albert. God bless you. Welcome. Hallelujah. So this supernatural rebirth enables all believers of the gospel, only those that choose to go to the light, only those that choose to believe that God exists and that he sent his messenger in human form, who we know is Jesus Christ, with the message of the coming kingdom of God, our invitation to it, and what we have to do to respond to that invitation, which is simply believe the gospel. If we believe the gospel, that means we believe the messenger who brought that message to us, who is Jesus Christ. And if we believe Jesus, that he told the truth, that also means we believe the author of the gospel also told the truth, who is the Father. All we need to do is believe it. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hallelujah. And it really is very simple. We don't need to make it 
harder than it is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those that believe the gospel are then added to the family of God. Amen. It's not about joining a church. Anybody can join a church. It's about God adding the believer of Christ, the believer of the gospel, to his church, which is called the ecclesia, or the assembly of called out believers. Amen. When we believe the gospel, we are added to God's church, and this makes us heirs to the promises of the Abrahamic covenant, which is the covenant that God made with Abraham. Mm. Now, this brings us all back to the parables of the mustard seed and the leaven in Matthew chapter 13. They are related to each other and they contain the same, they continue the same idea. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to go to verse 31. Hallelujah. Another parable put Jesus forth unto them, saying that the kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now, the parable of the leaven leads right into it. Another parable spake Jesus unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leaven. We see now that what Jesus was talking about was a reference to Sarah. And this particular instance that we just read about in Genesis chapter 18. Leaven. Leaven is the Greek word zume, which is used normally as a metaphor for habitual mental and moral corruption. And this corruption has a tendency to infect others, the thinking of others. Leaven is an additive that exaggerates the dimensions of the thing that it is put into, like dough. I mean, we all know you put it in, in, in meal and you add some water and you knead it, and the yeast causes that dough to inflate, to rise. Mm. Leaven also changes the characteristics of something that it's put into, like wine. You take yeast and you put it in grape juice and you put it in a dark place and it ferments and it changes the character and the, the actual um, substance into wine. So symbolically, leaven is used as a bad thing. It changes God's original context of scripture. In other words, when you add something to the scripture that is not along the same idea of what God originally intends, what is added changes the meaning. And quite often it changes it into something totally foreign to what God said. A perfect example of this is seen in Christ's temptation in the wilderness, where Satan adds something to the word and changes the meaning. He said, when he took him up to the pinnacle of the temple, he said, if you be the son of God, throw yourself down because it's written that his angels will, to paraphrase, will catch you lest at any time you dash your foot against the stone. That was from Psalm 91, I do believe. 
But when you read Psalm 91, you'll see that the words at any time don't exist there. Satan added those words, changing the meaning of what God said. God said that if we find ourselves in positions of danger, his angels will protect us, lest we dash our foot against the stone. In other words, lest we hurt ourselves, lest we, we die. Satan, by adding those three words at any time, changes the meaning ever so subtly to mean that we can purposely put ourselves in danger and God is obligated to save us each and every time. That's not what God said. And Jesus corrects him using the sword of the spirit. It is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Because purposely putting ourselves in danger, expecting God to come to our rescue, is tempting him. Mm. So we see this example of leaven, meaning something added to the word of God that changes its meaning. That's not a good thing. Hallelujah. Another example in Mark chapter 8, verse 15, Jesus warns his disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees, which was teaching that was rooted in religious fanaticism. He also warned them about the leaven of King Herod, which is teaching that is rooted in worldly reasoning such as what we see today, New Age teaching and mysticism, witchcraft, etc. So normally, leaven is used in a bad sense. But in these two parables that we just read uh, regarding uh, the parable of the leaven, hallelujah, just lost my scripture again, let me get it back. It's used in a good sense, meaning it's not talking about the thing that is added itself, but rather it's talking about what it does. Ah, the kingdom of heaven that was inserted into the world has an effect on the world, and it's a positive effect. Hallelujah. A positive effect. It's growing like a mustard seed. Amen? And this is the whole idea behind what Christ is saying regarding the kingdom of heaven in this case is like leaven. Hallelujah. Let me get back to the spot where we were. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So as we also discussed last time, this illustrates the process called metamorphosis or transformation. Hallelujah. Metamorphosis is a Greek word as well. The kingdom of heaven is, is uh, the infant, immature stage, while the kingdom of God is the mature stage. Leaven is not describing, as I said, the stuff that's added. It's the, heaven, the kingdom of heaven is not being compared to leaven in that it is added to something and in a bad sense. No. Rather, it talks about what leaven does. Ah, how it is growing and expanding in human society, changing the properties of human society from being 100% corrupt into containing both corruption and righteousness. Mm. It is those that reject the gospel that will be purged from the kingdom of heaven when Christ returns. And what will be left will be 100% righteousness, which is known as the kingdom of God. Mm. 
Hallelujah. This is what the kingdom of heaven is in the process of doing now, right now, as we speak. Hallelujah. God bless you, Brother Willie, Sister Aisha. God bless you. Hallelujah. So the kingdom of heaven is compared to the process of Sarah making the bread for God. It started as meal. Leaven was added to it. It was then kneaded or stirred up and baked, finally becoming bread. Bread symbolizes the word of God, which is the final mature stage. Mm. Now, the day after he supernaturally fed the multitudes of Samaritans with the bread and the fish, those Samaritans returned to Jesus the next day looking for more food. Jesus confronted them about that. He said, you're not here for me. You're just here for the free food. You're just looking for more fish sandwiches. He corrects them with this statement. In John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said unto them, look at this, I am the bread of life. And he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So this is saying that our focus should be on seeking Christ and not merely the blessings that Christ can provide. That is in direct opposition to the gospel of prosperity, which states basically that God doesn't want his people poor. He wants us all to be rich. So if you give to this ministry, God will bless you and he'll make you rich. And that's a great reason to get saved. The devil is a liar. It's not about being rich. It's not about looking to Christ like, my name is Jimmy, gimme, gimme, gimme. We are to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Christ first. Hallelujah. And then all of these things will be added unto us. So our first priority should be in seeking Christ and not what he can give. Hallelujah. Let's go to Matthew chapter six. Let's take a look at that. Verses 31 through 33, where Jesus tells the people, therefore take no thought, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you need these things, all of these things. But here we go. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, God's right way of doing things. And all these things, which he just mentioned, natural food, drink, and clothing, all these things shall be added unto you. Now, there's a dual application to that passage. The bread of life, food, the living water, drink, which you can read about in Revelation chapter 22, and clothing. This refers to the white robes of the righteous in the kingdom of God. Hold that place. Let's go to Revelation chapter 19. I'm going to read verses 5 through 9. Hallelujah. Again, John is telling us about the vision that he saw. And he says, verse five, and a voice came out of the throne saying, praise our God, all ye servants and ye that fear him, both small and great. And John heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters. And as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord omnipotent or almighty reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. Why? For the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. 
So this is this means that earthly Jerusalem has come out of the idolatry of Babylon. Verse 8, and as a result, to her, New Jerusalem, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, white, clean and white. And it tells us this very important piece of information. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Ah, verse 9. And the voice speaking in verse 6, saith unto John, Write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. These invited guests that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb are the believers of Christ, known as the church. And he saith unto John, these are the true sayings of God. Now, what is absolutely amazing, and, and it's another reason why we should all study with a concordance. This word sayings is actually the Greek word logos, ah, which are the thoughts, ideas, and concepts of God that are contained in God's eternal plan. The same plan that has been kept secret from before the time that God created mankind. The same reason why Christ spoke in parables. Mm. This, parage is, this passage, I should say, is actually talking about the culmination of God's plan that has been kept secret from before the time that he created mankind. The kingdom of heaven being now transformed into the final stage called the kingdom of God. That's what we just read. The parable of the leaven tells us that the kingdom of heaven was quietly inserted into the world, permeating it like leaven and it's still doing it now. Like leaven, the kingdom of heaven is the agent causing the irreversible transformation of corrupt human society into the righteous saints of God through faith. And it's made possible by God's grace, his undeserved gift, called regeneration, which makes us able to be able to perceive the gospel, which is the invitation to the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. God's wisdom, scripture calls it his manifold wisdom, which means multi-layered. They are things that God does that causes something else, which leads to something else, which leads to something else, all of which in the end, fulfill his plan for mankind. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As the promised child, Isaac and the generations of his direct family would be the heirs to Abraham's earthly possessions or Abraham's kingdom. Let's look at the symbols. Likewise, Jesus as the promised child, is the heir to his heavenly father's spiritual kingdom. Ah, and that is the kingdom of God. Christ will be the king in the kingdom of God. Mm. Those who believe the gospel are supernaturally transformed when we believe the gospel, amen and added to the family or assembly of God, also known as the kingdom of heaven, the ecclesia, the church. Mm. In closing, we can see the relationship of the kingdom of heaven to leaven. What began as a small family consisting of only Abraham and Sarah 
has grown into a worldwide family through Christ. So numerous that it can't be counted. And it's called right now the kingdom of heaven. As implied in the parable, the family of God is growing. Hallelujah. And it's influencing a permanent change and a permanent transformation in human society. It's doing that right now. The parables of the sower, the wheat, and the tares, the mustard seed, and the leaven tell us of the origin of this earthly spiritual kingdom called the kingdom of heaven. And it also tells us how it will be eventually transformed into the eternal spiritual kingdom called the kingdom of God. You see, but just reading the parable and trying to glean what it's trying to say to us is merely just scratching the surface. We have to go deeply into the scriptures, amen, if we are going to understand what God is saying to us. It's really easy to misunderstand and to apply, as I've always said, contemporary understanding. But when we do that, we will always be wrong. We must let scripture interpret scripture and allow the Holy Spirit to anoint us. I mean, it's amazing. You know, God says, you know, ask what you will and shall be added unto you. Knock and it shall be open. Ask and it shall be given. But how many of us ask for anointing? How many of us are instructed from the pulpit to ask for anointing to be able to understand God's word? Instead, we're told to ask for the new spouse or the new job or the new car or the new house or creative ideas so that we can get rich. Bypassing God bypassing, understanding his word, which are the words of life. We must dig deep into his word. Amen. If we want to understand it, it's like drilling for oil and oil being uh, symbolic of anointing. Nobody ever goes out into the desert someplace, turns over a rock, and all of a sudden there's a gusher of oil. No, it doesn't happen that way. You have to get the right equipment, and you have to dig deep until you hit that pocket of oil. And once you do, it rushes to the surface. Well, the right equipment we need, one, is the Bible, the Word of God, and two, concordances, lexicons, study materials, and study tools that we can use to help us understand what the Bible is saying, what God is saying. A lot has been lost in its translation from Hebrew and Greek into English. So we must go back to the original Hebrew and Greek. But I'm sure many of you, just like me, I can tell you the Greek word. I can tell you the Hebrew word. I can tell you what it means in English, but as far as conducting a coherent conversation fluently in Hebrew and Greek, I can't do it. I don't speak Greek or Hebrew. This is where the lexicon really comes in handy and, and the concordance. It'll tell you what the word means and how it's used in that sentence. And that's when understanding comes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So as we have covered in closing, because we're right about to close, the, these parables that we just read all tell us about the kingdom of heaven. Now, next time we're going to go into the parable of the merchant followed by, no, it's not the merchant. First, we go into the parable of the hidden treasure followed by the merchant, followed by 
the pearl of great price. All of those work together to give us another understanding, not necessarily about the kingdom of heaven, but our behavior, our conduct, how we respond to it. Hallelujah. And once we go through these parables, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, line by line, digging deep to understand what God is saying, the other parables all of a sudden come into clear view and we gain understanding. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for interceding where equipment and electronics began to fail. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for anointing us afresh this evening, teaching us your word about your kingdom that you have so graciously added us to. Hallelujah. Making us your representatives. And Heavenly Father, I thank you for using me as your mouthpiece to speak your word, Father. Mm. I pray that your people were edified. I know I was edified. Hallelujah. And I pray more so that you have been glorified and receive all the glory, Lord. Hallelujah. So we give you praise and thanks for all things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. Well, I don't know exactly what time it is. Oh, it's only about 930. Amen. If at this time we have anybody that um, has any questions they would like to ask, please type it in. Uh, if you have any comments that you would just like to add, anything that the Lord dropped in your heart, please type the comments in. Amen. We'll answer questions in the, in the few minutes that we have left. Hallelujah. And as um, that is coming forth, again, just as a, a quick reminder, again, my newest book, the book of Daniel, which is a fully annotated study of the book of Daniel, line by line, verse by verse, the complete uh, book of Daniel, amen, is available at lulu.com. You can also get the quick link at our website, which is transformingwordnyc.org. Amen. You can click on the books that are available and it'll take you right to the site. Uh, it's available in print form. And if you don't want to wait, you can download it immediately as an ebook. Amen. I just want to thank all of you in advance for being supportive of my ministry. And, and I pray that it blesses you and edifies you so that we can understand the word of God just that much more. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, amen. If uh, we don't have any questions or if uh, nothing anybody would like to add, God bless you. I want to thank all of you that joined with us this evening. Amen. Again, I apologize for uh, technology not working the way it's supposed to. Amen. I have my Bible on my tablet, so it's really easy to be able to find scriptures immediately. Um, however, there was some type of technical glitch. Amen. But God still got the glory in all of this. Amen. Hallelujah. By God's grace, we will be back again next week. And next week, uh, we won't even be in April anymore. Next week is May 1st on Tuesday. By God's grace, we will be back again with our next teaching on the parables of Christ. And that should be the parable of the hidden treasure. Amen. That's 8.30 p.m. Eastern time if you live in a different uh, time zone or if you live in a different um, country. Amen. Please make sure to take that into consideration so as not to miss anything. Amen. God bless you, Brother Frankie. You are very, very welcome. Thank you for not considering it a robbery of your time to spend with us as we go through the word of God. Of course, everybody is invited. Please invite a friend to join with you next time and do feel free to share this video with anybody, if you want to send it, email, text, can't send it snail mail, but you can share it with whomever you like. It's not about building Transforming Word Ministries. It is about building the family of God and edifying the body of Christ. Preaching is good. 
get you excited, but it's teaching that will get us into the kingdom because we will then understand what God is saying and not merely reacting to what God is saying. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you all. We'll see you next time. We love you with the love of the Lord. And remember, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Don't take anybody's word for it. Check it out yourself. Make sure it's right. And if you find out that it's right, receive it with an open heart. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Good night.